Good evening, residents of the town of Sunderland. <clears throat> we have Chief Thomas Harding, who is uh, Chief in Shrewsbury right now. He's our final, uh, our final, final list that have been put forward by our screening co committee just to uh, pass the ground rules on to your chief. We are on TV. Um, we have no time constraints. Uh, All right. So if you want to stay here for three or four hours, we're, we're okay. The guy in back has a pillow, so he doesn't care. The cameras will keep on rolling. Um, we have a, a, a group of questions that uh, we hope you will be uh, to help hope for us to learn a little bit more about you. Um, we may have some follow-ups in those questions. Um, if at any time you'd like to uh, take a break or get water or whatever, go okay. ahead and just let us know. All right. Okay. We're pretty, we're pretty flexible here. <clears throat> Again, we want we want to learn as much about you as possible during this uh, during this interview. Um, so, I'd like to call us to order, please, at uh, six thirty four. Um, Mr. Bergeron, first question, please. Uh, Chief, thanks so much for not only applying, but going through the screening process. I heard that they were pretty tough, so I appreciate you uh, <laughs> taking the time to see us tonight. So first up for us is, if you wouldn't mind uh, taking the time to describe uh, three specific accomplishments in your, in your current law enforcement career. Uh, as far as my current position goes, uh, when I started uh, in my present position, there was no mutual aid with the adjoining towns. Now we um, have a border with two Hampshire County towns, Amherst and Pelham. Um, so I established those. Um, I think that the, the town employees, and this is primarily the fire department and the highway department, those are the people who are there every day, like the police department, to be able to have this kind of cooperative relationship. It's a, it's a give and take thing. Um, there's a lot of benefits to that, um, to, to the departments as well as the community. And um, I guess I found out that uh, what they told me when I took the job, which is primarily complaints about dirt roads and barking dogs, was true. That would be the third one. <laughs> that they're still there? <laughs> that still is, occupies a lot of time for myself and the officers. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Chief. David? Um, okay, I'm going to uh, just kind of hop around. I'll go. Uh, based on your knowledge of our town and its demographics, identify the program areas you'd focus on and describe how you would, un <clears throat> excuse me, intend to undertake the tasks of a new chief during your first six months. So, in other words, you're coming in. What are the things you'd like to tackle first when you go in? Um, you know, you have three full-time officers with significant experience and skills. You've got some uh, people with instructor credentials. So I think the first thing is to sit down with the folks that you have. I mean, you have some part-timers who've been here a while as well, but those people have been the, the core of the police department for quite a while. And to sit down with them and find out what they think is working and what's not working. Um, that's the primary thing. Um, I think that uh, it's important for the new chief in a community to go around and introduce themselves to uh, the, the businesses, the schools, uh, the rental offices here for the uh, apartment complexes, um, and just basically put yourself out there and let people know that you're available, and then go from there. Chief, if you um, just kind of follow up on that, if there's three people that you definitely have to, besides police officers, or three people you definitely would want to meet with, who would they be? Outside of the police department. Outside, yes, sir. Um, the school, probably, primarily. I think that's uh, in any small community, especially, that's a, 
something that whether you have kids in that school or have gone to that school or not, that that is kind of a the most precious asset that the community has. Um, I would probably want to speak with the fire department as they are, um, there's a partnership there both in day-to-day -day stuff and emergency management side of things. Um, so the emergency management director and the fire department <clears throat> and here, you know, you all have a situation where they occupy the same building. So it would be <laughs> beneficial to get along with your neighbors. And then probably the town administrator and or the uh, finance people. Thank you, Chief. Could you uh, please explain your approach to promoting the concept of community-oriented policing throughout all sections of the police department? Um, I think it's uh, accessibility and availability. And as far as the chief goes, especially in a small town where you are able to, you know, have consistent contact with the officers in the department, that this is one of those lead by example kind of things. Um, and community policing is, uh, I mean, really small town policing has always been that way. Um, you know, in, in policing, that's kind of a trend that comes and goes and it seems to be coming back in larger departments now but you know small town policing is community policing it's you know being out in the community um, being available to answer questions um, having a consistency so the community can expect the same kind of response and, and fair treatment from anybody from the chief down to the junior part-time officer and all the folks in between um, and that's something that takes a while you can't just make an announcement and make it so um, so there's a timeline there, um, but everybody in the police department has to work at that and be on the same page. So it's just, you know, going out every day and getting that done. And, you know, some people will be more open to that than others. Um, you know, it, this is a, a, a job policing in general that, you know, you kind of have to earn trust and respect every day. So, um, that's what it is. It's an everyday thing of being out there and being available. Chief, as a follow-up, you have one, let's say one officer, doesn't matter, part-time, full-time, mm. that um, doesn't take that directive to heart. How, how do you persuade him that that's where we really need to be going as a department? Uh, you know, the face-to-face -face communication is good. Um, I don't know if you have an evaluation system in place, but that is a kind of a secondary thing where you're doing personnel evaluations. And to use the, uh, the other officers, whether they're supervisors or they're, they're line officers to, you know, again, it, it, it's a, a team thing in a smaller department in a, in a smaller community. And, um, you know, nobody gets it right all the time. And so as a supervisor or as a chief, you know, that is part of our responsibility is to kind of keep on those things, to have follow-up. You need to lay out what the expectations are and then help them achieve those expectations. Thank you, Chief. Okay. I'm gonna jump a little ahead. When, when in, in your career, uh, when were you most satisfied in your work? When am I most satisfied? Were or are? Sure. Um, I think, you know, it's just basically being able to help people. I and mean, that's the reason that myself and most officers I know, that's why you get into this line of work, is to be able to help people. In a small community, um, one of the advantages you have is you have a certain amount of time. This is not Amherst, where they're going from call to call to call. You have this, the same responsibility to everybody. And in a small town, you really have more time to be involved. So <clears throat> whereas a larger town, I'm not going to pick on Amherst, but a larger community um, where their activity level is a lot higher, they may be able to hand out a business card for um, you know, a resource, depending on what the situation is. In a smaller town, the nice thing is the officer has the ability to not you know, just provide you the information, but to assist you with, with contacting that person. Um, you know, all these resources that are available 
um, it's a lot easier for um, a, a person involved in some kind of crisis situation to have at least one person through that process who's kind of consistently there, um, whether that's physically with them or available by a phone call or having follow-up by the officer. So, um, you know, that's something that you don't have an opportunity to do in a larger department in a larger, larger town. Um, it also, you know, there is downtime in a small town. It's not, uh, it's not going from call to call. And, you know, it helps keep the officers engaged, which in my experience kind of leads to a certain amount of job satisfaction. You're not limited to, you know, writing speeding tickets or, you know, going to any particular kind of call that you have the, all these other things that you can do. And most people have a lot of different areas where they have this ability, but in a larger department, you're more funneled in kind of a single direction. And so a small town, um, you know, at the, at the, uh, with the assistance of the chief anyway, that you keep people engaged and getting involved in, in other things that interest them outside of just, you know, routine police work. Thanks. Appreciate that. Um, talk to us about your financial skills and experience and what areas would you look at to stretch the budget in a small town uh, police department? In other words, how would you approach that, especially given, you know, you know, everybody's got huge budgets. Uh, you know, there's only the, the pie is only so big in a small town. So um, there are a lot of uh, assets, physical assets, that can be shared, say, between the police department and the fire department. Um, my view, as far as the way that I run the budget presently, is <clears throat> so there's only so much money, and there's only so many ways that you all can get more money and that's generally in a smaller town that's property taxes and you know people may disagree about a lot of things but they tend to always agree their property taxes are too high so that's not the first place you want to go um, you have to prioritize things as far as the police department goes whether that's you know staffing whether that's equipment whether that's training um, so you start with a baseline where there are things that are mandated either by state whether that's training you have a union here there are contractual obligations so you, you start out with these things that are not really optional. You fund those things. Then you see the money that's left over. Um, from there, you know, with input from everybody in, uh, you know, from the select board, from the finance committee, you talk to the other departments. What are the things that they think are needed? The officers certainly make a contribution to that, um, whether it's additional training beyond what's mandatory. Um, so you kind of have to pick and choose. And if you don't get it this year, maybe wait till next year. You know, you have to take kind of a long view because there's not an endless supply of money, whether it's funding from the taxpayers or it's grant money or uh, anything like that. And as far as grants go, you know, there's no such thing as free money. So um, community policing was a great program. That money's not there anymore. So, you know, you're always kind of reassessing your priorities as far as what you can finance and those things that you have to either let go of or you know put off for another day <clears throat> chief and we have as you mentioned earlier we have a a, a mixture of part-time and full-time how in in our budget what do you think would be well in a typical budget like we would have or have in a small town how how do you mix and match that part-time full-time ratio what, what are you looking for uh, you know a big part of that is how much money are you looking at um, a part-time officer generally is a lower hourly rate they don't have the cost of, of benefits that go along with that on the other hand if they're working a minimal amount you're doing a disservice to the community and to the officer because stuff falls through the cracks even in a small town you know if they work every Saturday things that happen over seven days since they last work are you know can be very important to them doing their job um, I think that as far as on the community end of it goes they shouldn't there shouldn't be any distinction in a resident's mind between a part-timer or a full-timer they should expect the same kind of, of treatment the same kind of assistance um, but, you know, again, in a small town, one of the, the drawbacks that you have is, is retention, especially on the part-time side. I mean, you all are very lucky to have the experienced staff that, that you do have. 
Um, I know there are some part-timers who have been here a while, but it's my sense that you know, you're, you're going to get people at an entry level in their career for part-time officers. There's only so much that Sunderland can offer them as far as career advancement. Um, so you have to accept that their amount of time in the department is going to be limited, and you certainly can't fault somebody for trying to you know, get a, a full-time position um, if that's the career they want to go in. So uh, as far as an operational budget thing, part-timers are definitely an asset to the town. And they can't be, you know, there can't be this distinction as far as the way they're treated by the chief and the full-time members of the department that somehow they're different because they're a part-timer. So, you know, it's a, it's a team, especially in a small department. And just as importantly is the perception the community has that, you know, there shouldn't be any Oh, well, I'll wait till the full-time guy comes on. You know, you don't want that. People have an issue, they want the officer to deal with it. So, you know, here you all have 24-hour coverage. You could hire full-time people to, you know, cover all that, and the vacation days and sick days and training days and, and backfill. Um, or you can use part-time people, which generally, um, if, this is what the town wants is to maintain 24 7 coverage you're going to have to use part-time people and they have to be you know included in the overall department mission and made made to feel part of that it, it's it's um in the last couple of years we've had part-time officers a come up to full-time officer in sunderland yeah. we also had officers go to where uh Agawam, northampton uh -huh. And other larger forces so you're you're correct I mean they, they they do get a lot of experience and and most of them are doing part-time in many towns not just one town also but they gain that experience I would agree with that yeah. okay chief what is the uh, appropriate role and responsibility of a local police department in keeping our school students and staff safe um, well, as I said I mean I, I, I think the school <clears throat> especially in a small town is a priority um, there are school safety issues and these things um, benefit the community in a larger sense so uh, when school safety and lockdown drills and you know police response to these things first started happening you know, every community has a different threshold for what they're willing to have. It's an elementary school, you know, it's not a correctional facility, it's not, you know, it needs to look like an elementary school. That is a, a, a center point in most communities is their elementary school, especially in small towns. So with officers being there every day, I mean, my own experience was it was uh, troubling to parents and even some staff in the school because this was something new at the time that the police department was not really there except when there was a problem and in a big picture you don't want to have people in town feeling the only reason they see a police officer is because there's trouble um, and that benefits in other ways I mean you may inevitably end up at the home of one of these kids where there's an issue and at least they know who you are so that is a benefit that they they know that officer they see you at the school they see you at school functions they see you at the parade that you have in town so um, that kind of communication with the school and, and interacting with them not just on the safety component but all these other things that you know kind of have a way of reaching out into other areas that the police department is involved with in the community because that's the community down in the elementary school yeah. so chief do, do you spend I mean do you envision spending time with the staff um, just sit sitting with the staff and talking about different things and and preparation or is it mainly doing the drills that 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 would be most important uh, you know the drills are definitely an important thing um, you know you don't want to be that community in the news where something like that happens and um, but that is only one part of it um, you know, we started following school buses, for example. One route, you know, different route every day. <clears throat> First response was bus drivers wondering if they're looking to, you know, give tickets to the bus drivers. No. They're, you know, 
there are, you know, in smaller towns where people, I mean, I've seen this down by my house, where, um, you know, people, for whatever reason, will pass a school bus. So there's a safety issue there. Um, people get to know that commute through town or people who live in town that if there's a school bus, chances are there's going to be a, a police car probably behind the school bus. So we alleviated the concern of the bus drivers that we are out there to write them tickets. So now the officer follows the bus to the school. You can chat with the staff. There are a lot of things that the, the school and the police department share as far as issues at home for kids. Um, the system is not always set up so that there's this communication that everybody's working with the same information. That's another benefit of having the police involved in the school. And it doesn't have to be the chief, but it has to be consistent in that, you know, the more officers they know, the, the better, so that they're not looking at the police officer's presence as meaning that there's trouble. As far as talking with the administrators in the school, you know, I understand that their time is limited, and the way that I operate is if they have time, they will let me know if they have a question, if they have an issue they need to bring to uh, our attention, they will do that. And sometimes they have meetings. I mean, they have a lot of other things to do. So, but we are always there. And that's this whole thing about accessibility and approachability is that people have to really, and this, you know, can only be done over time. Consistency, that they know there's, you know, officer friendly, he's there at the school every day, or she's always there when the, when the school gets out and, you know, knows the kids. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the safety of the schools is, is very important, but there's a, a, a bigger reason for the police being there as much as they're able to. Thank you, Chief. So, Chief, if I could, what impacts on the small towns or our region do some of the new technology challenges we have out in front of us? Pose, benefits, risks, your opinion? Um, you know, there's a lot of good aspects to that. Um, mobile data terminals are one thing that that is a technology that's definitely beneficial for the officer. And, you know, in a situation where we've got a regional dispatch, they're dealing with, you know, 28 or 30 other police and fire departments. So if the officer can initiate these things and get the information that they need, that's fine. That's one less thing the dispatcher has to deal with. On the other hand, you know, the technology, just because it's available, doesn't make it a useful tool to every police department. Um, you know, you have uh, plate readers, you know, on the, on the backs of, on, on mounted on cruisers, you have uh, body cameras, you have tasers, you have, um, you know, the use of social media and officers getting involved in, in um, populating that stuff, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or whatever. So the, I, I think you have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. And of course, there's also a cost that comes along with the hardware, with the training that's required um, to stack on top of that. So you kind of have to pick and choose. And in a lot of cases, whether it's the, you know, there has to be a discussion. There needs to be some kind of consensus. You can't make these decisions in a vacuum is that I think officers should have body cameras so we're going to have body cameras you know there's a policy that goes with that there's a review process by the select board that goes with that the officers are going to have opinions about that one way or the other and all those things need to be factored in before you decide you know this is the technology now we're going to integrate into all the other things that we're already using so it's a case-by-case -case basis that's kind of what we did with tasers scott volunteered to be tased but Good man. Yeah. I was too thick skinned. <laughs> yeah. Um, when do you, I guess my 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 biggest concern is is I want and I think our board would want our officers to be protected out on the street. A lot of times. Um, everybody has a camera phone and you never know necessarily what part of the video you're getting you're, you're you may get the end of the video out but you may not get the beginning where things start i, I so it it's tough for me wanting can i i i personally believe that through the training that our officers received and their experience mm. they're i i i would i would think that they were going to do the right thing but Sometimes it's not my opinion that really matters. Um, and, I, and I just want to make sure that our 
officers have the best tools to do their job to the best of their abilities. And I, I you know, and when we look at the body cameras and the, the cameras and the cruisers and that kind of stuff, I just, I just don't know which way to go. You know, I don't know what's going to give them the most help. Um, the officers will definitely have an opinion on that. I mean, we're in a situation where it's between body cameras and tasers. We're not presently carrying tasers. I don't have any issues in the time that I've been up there. I mean, people will complain about an officer's demeanor or that something they think is unfair. Fine. Absolutely. I think most officers expect when you stop somebody that you should pretty much assume that they have a cell phone that is videotaping you, or that's the wrong terminology, but they are recording. You would think so. Okay. So I don't have any issues. I have not had any issues, I should say, with uh, liability where an officer is acting way over the line inappropriately. I do have incidents where officers have been injured and put in the hospital. For me, that's the priority. So tasers takes priority at this time over body cameras. So we're working towards in the new fiscal year, they'll start carrying tasers. So, um, you know, the video thing, and again, you know, the camera, I worked as a news photographer at Channel 22 when I first got out of community college. And I know, because I was the person who shot the video and edited the video, just because it's on the camera, that is not the whole story. All right, that is not always an accurate depiction. And that's the same with someone sitting in the driver's seat with a cell phone recording an officer's interaction. That can be edited, that can be, you know, you see this much, you don't see after and you don't see before. Um, like I said, I think most officers kind of expect now, whether it's a, a, a motor vehicle stop or you're at somebody's house, you should just expect that somebody there has a camera. And so, you know, you should just do your job. And if you're not doing anything wrong, it doesn't mean people won't accuse you of it. But in the end, you know, if you're doing your job properly, things will come out well. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Uh, sort of as a follow-up to that question, um, with a, the, well, the, the use of social media and everything, how are you guys using it now and how do you see um, using it going forward? Um, it's a bit of shameless self-promotion, for one thing. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, wherever people get their information from, I think it's nice to know uh, in any town, small town or large town, what it is the police are doing. You know, whether they are um, you know, going to traffic accidents, whether they are making arrests for, you know, drug-related stuff. Uh, whether they're rounding up loose horses. I mean, you know, this whole scope of things that police officers do every day, I th think that most people get their information from the television, which is a horrible thing. Um, so you're able to, you know, it's, it, it's kind of, uh, I say, I mean, it's promotion of the police department. On the other hand, it also can be interactive um, in that you're looking for help. You can't always go door to door and find out, did you see, do you know, that kind of thing. Right. And people, I mean, our experience is people are more than willing to get involved and give you information. And that's a, it's a time saver for officers that are trying to conduct an investigation and you're working with limited time and limited resources. Um, things like Twitter, uh, which we are fairly new to, you know, Twitter is more of immediate stuff. Um, so that can be, uh, you know, dangerous weather, you know, roads closed, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so that's more interactive, more immediate, whereas as Facebook, which is the other platform we use, is to just show them, look, this, this is what we're doing. And, you know, I think people appreciate knowing that. All right. Thanks. Chief. We've talked with with our neighboring towns a couple times. I know uh, Leverett Shootsbury has talked about it um, about some regionalization and or um, sharing of services. Um, could you explain what benefits and challenges you would see from a shared um, either police force or administration of a department? Not regionalization. You're talking about. I, well, I would say I would say both. It could be cooperation. You you can address both if you like. That's fine. Well, as you know, the regionalization thing. I, I mean, I 
if you want me to expound on this, I, I will, but I prefer not to go down that path. Okay. I know that you all just looked at that. It's something that I have looked at over the last several years. Um, I have talked to chiefs who have been involved in discussions about regionalization. Um, I've talked to the folks at Novak who did the consulting. They've done a lot of stuff, Central Mass. Most of them are Western Central Mass. Um, as far as that goes, I would just say it's expensive. To start it up, it's expensive. And again, you know, there's limited money. So uh, I think the consultant even told you all that if you're, if you're getting into this today to save money, then we don't need to be here. Correct. Um, but I do think that down the road, this is something, you know, this state is very unique in compared to the rest of the country where it's not done. And sooner or later, uh, there are people uh, of the opinion, and I happen to be one, is that smaller towns are going to be impacted by these things that are coming down the line where you're going to have the opportunity to choose between, especially towns where they operate exclusively with part-time police officers, that that may not be an option for them. So do they hire full-time officers? Do they rely exclusively on the state police? Do they defer to the sheriff's department, which is not done in this state, but it's pretty common practice most other places? That's regionalization. I think uh, I'm always surprised that folks in the, in the towns around this part of Franklin County don't understand that operationally this kind of, um, you know, backing each other up, that police are going to other towns. That was the whole function of mutual aid to begin with. We all have limited amount of staffing. So a lot of that was being done anyway. Um, there is some duplication of effort. I mean, a lot of my job, I don't have an administrative assistant. I know that there's a part-time, I, I don't know how many hours are involved with that, but there's an administrative assistant. So different towns have you know, 10 hours a week, 20 hours a week. That relieves the chief of a lot of that kind of administrative stuff. Um, so as far as sharing a chief, I think there are a lot of benefits to that. Um, big advantage is you're going to save money right away. Um, you're going to split salary. You're going to split benefits. You're going to split vehicles for the chief if you're talking about sharing a chief. You're going to save that money right up front. Downside is you can't just go into a town. There's a timing issue here. You can't go into a town and say, we want to share a chief with these four towns. So who's the lucky person that gets to be that shared chief and what happens to the other ones? So, you know, generally this is looked at, same for regionalization. There has to be this kind of alignment of the stars where you don't want to buy out the chief's contract. So you've got to wait for people to leave and discuss it as it comes along. There is a, another downside, which is a cost in a department where you've got sergeants who may have worked their way into that role waiting for the chief to retire to the beach and now you're taking that opportunity away that's not a money thing but it's something that should be given consideration that a lot of the smaller towns um you know this is an issue and so now you're going to say well we're going to share a chief and that benef benefits us, us financially but now you've created, you know, a potential morale problem for that individual who is waiting for that chief to leave. You know, how do you sell this to them? So and the other thing is you can't go into it quickly, that there needs to be an adequate discussion and a look at all these different things. I mean, the money, who doesn't want to save money? I'm sure you all do. I'm sure, you know. But there are, you know, people involved here who have committed, you know, their time and their careers to you know, this is the timeline career-wise that they want, that they want <clears throat> the chief's job and they're willing to put it in time till the chief retires. And, you know, you have to consider that too. So money-wise, that's kind of a no-brainer. But there are these other things that have to be looked at. And, you how know. Chief, how, how about, like, like, the sharing of the talents in the forces also? But that's going on anyway. See, that's why I think is <clears throat> a lot of times you don't, people don't realize that. Um, so for one thing, I keep the select board informed of, of stuff that's going on to the point where it's appropriate. <clears throat> so that I still think that they don't realize how often, you know, New Salem comes to Shootsbury. 
we've had Sunderland officers in Shutesbury. Absolutely. There are people in Amherst that don't even know where Shutesbury is, and we border that town. Okay. <laughs> So all I'm saying is day to day, you already have officers that are crossing jurisdictional lines and they're protected because these mutual aid agreements are in place. So as far as that goes, that's already being done. We just started, I had an officer that graduated from the academy, he's full time. Before he went to the academy, he's a younger guy. He wanted to be a school resource officer. I sent him to the program and now we're in a school union just like you all are. He goes around to the schools in the union. We also, and, and for a while, we've been coming into Sunderland for the lockdown drills because we are the people who are gonna come when there's a bad thing that happens at the school, you're gonna get plenty of police officers there. But your officers in town are gonna be the first people there, and by the time the rest of us get there, the worst part is probably over, and then it's the crime scene part that goes. So this kind of cooperation and stuff, this is happening already as far as the officers and sharing of resources. We had a meeting at the superintendent's office. Their finance person says, I think I can get some grant money. So now I don't have to eat the cost of having this officer go out to provide these services to other schools. That can be offset by grants. You know, grants come and go, but for the time being, sure, we're willing to look into that. So those kinds of things can be done absent this arrangement that you're, you're talking about. Yeah, I, I was looking at, I was looking, Chief, I was looking more like um, in, in a department, you may have a, uh, an officer that's trained in domestic violence as a, an instructor. You may have a firearms or a weapons uh, instructor. Yeah. And, and, and to me, it, it's it's utilizing those, instead of just teaching within the, dep the Sunderland Department, you would teach in other, you'd bring more people together and, and you would you would share. So let's say Shootsbury had a domestic abuse trained officer that officer would come down to Sunderland and work with our with our people we have a weapons officer we would go maybe leverage who's very whitely Deerfield we all come together and we would and, and for two reasons see I agree 100% with what you're saying I think it's absolutely important critical I don't know what other adjectives to use that our officers in our neighboring towns get to know and work with one another in a lot of different environments because those are the only the people the only people that you're going to depend on when that bell rings those are the only people that are going to be there with you right we we know that we we've seen that um going back 20 years it's, if, if something happens in Sunderland we get Montague cops come in we get Deerfield cops we get Whiteley cops we get Shrewsbury cops same thing if something happens in Whiteley yeah there's no question I also think it's important that they work outside of those flashing lights that they where they would train together and they get to know one another as well I mean a lot of that is as far as the training and that is being done as well we've had officers at the Sunderland Public Safety Complex getting training we you know we stay in touch with each other so you have this working relationship of the, of the day to day stuff on the shifts then you're able to also train together whether that's firearms training or it's a legal update or it's domestic violence whatever it is more contact more interaction like you're saying this is an important thing so that you don't you know you're not just seeing each other when they need another cop that you know it's 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 got a social aspect to it but it's also you know it's professional development this is being done already because you know again we're getting back to the money thing here you have to pay an officer to go to Springfield that is part of the complaint of folks up here in this part of the county is the time to drive down to Springfield because that's where the, the training for this part of the state is. But you had the Chiefs Association for Franklin County starting to run a part-time academy up at GCC. Mm -hmm. That It's cheaper, you know, it's less time for the officers. You've got the resources as far as the instructors for doing the academy, why wouldn't you do that? And then on the, on the more regular kinds of training, whether it's firearms or domestic violence, that is being done. Um, I, I think that could be developed more, but you know, each department has some of these instructors and whether or not they teach for the academy, you know, all of us, all the departments in this part of the county, in Hampshire County too. I mean, we have people that go to Hadley, that go to Amherst College, that go to Pelham, that go to Amherst PD. 
that is just keeping lines of communication open to find these opportunities and develop those relationships what you're saying is so they're not just seeing each other in a work context but they're also seeing each other in a training context which makes the work part hopefully generally go smoother if you train together so some of this is being done already it's not like you know if you had a had a shared chief that they're breaking totally new ground I mean and and some departments are more open to it than others so okay thank you chief mm -hmm. Scotty so why are you interested in this role in this town what I told the screening committee was it's a shorter commute I can see the public safety complex from my house <laughs> practical um, you know this oh, is a it, it's, right to work you won't need a cruiser. Could, that's a right. Bicycle. Blue lights on the bicycle. Um, you know, you're a 24-7 department. You're a large town when you put it in perspective of Shrewsbury being about 1,800 people. Um, I think that I, I would like to utilize more skills in a larger department. You have more full-time people here. You have, um, you know, you have business here. We don't have that in Shrewsbury. There's no business there. Um, so it's just a, the ability to kind of do more with um, those things that I've already invested in myself, whether it's education and experience. That would be the short answer. To come to the big town. Uh, a whopping 3,700 people. Big just night. twice what we have in Shrewsbury. Yeah, right. <laughs> David, any more? Um, no, we kind of covered the, the mm -hmm. regional one, so um, I guess I'll do that last one. Do you have any questions for us? I do not. No. If I could just finish up. Sure. Chief, could, could you describe failure? Failure? Yeah. is uh, not getting the, the outcome that you desired or worked towards. Um, in final, in this role, how would you, well, what would you consider success in the role of chief in the town of Sunderland? That everybody's happy. <laughs> I, guess we can why, I guess we can define failure yeah, again. That's, <laughs> right. And that's why it's a full-time job, because, you know, you have to work on that every day. I think that it's, first of all, you need to have officers that, you know, enjoy coming to work. Um, and I think most police officers, you know, that's why they do this job is the ability to help people and it's something different every day. And you're, you can never predict what, it, what your shift is gonna be like when you come in. So, you know, that is the main thing. Because if officers are unhappy, people, people can pick up on that. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, that's the first thing is within the department, people, you know, the officers that come in have to feel that they are, you know, able to use those abilities or, you know, pursue those interests that they have within the police department and that they enjoy coming to work, that they can trust the people that they work with. That is key. So all these things within the department, you know, if it's good in the department, that generally flows out into the community. If it's bad in the department, that also flows out into the community. And, you know, it's, it's obviously not good. So you need to work on morale, and a lot of that is just keeping officers, you know, feeling like they're supported, whether it's the chief, whether it's you all, that the town supports them. Knowing that we can't get everything that we want, new cruisers, firearms, you know, whatever it is, fine. But there has to be this overwhelming sense that we can trust the police department. Within the police department, we can trust each other. And, and you just kind of work with that every day. You know, you need to work on this every day. Chief, would, would you consider yourself a, a tactical person or a strategic person? Mm. I guess uh, strategic. I mean, to my mind, the tactical function comes under 
strategic. You know, you hear this strategic planning is, is a big thing now, which is kind of a big picture, and then you have all these pieces under, uh, underneath that. Community policing, you have emergency management, um, and you have a tactical component to that. So I would say strategic, viewing tactical as being an element of the str strategic kind of thing. What, what we've said to uh, other candidates, and I'll, I'll repeat it, I think Board of Selectmen, um, there's a few hires that we make that almost define a board, town administrator, fire chief, uh, yeah. highway, police chief. School committee is kind of defined by who they hire for as superintendents and as principals. Yeah. But those, th those four or five people that we hire, that the board hires, really influence our communities. Um, and, and that's why it takes us a while when, to make these decisions, because they are, they are important. We, I believe they're really important decisions. Yep. Um, appreciate your candor tonight. <laughs> I was, it was a good interview. I, I liked I liked the candor. I liked the the the, go, the back and forth. Um, I, uh, we've also said before there's a level of trust between a board of selectmen and and chief of police that um, most people don't know. Um, mm, yeah. Unless you sit sit in both chairs, you don't understand that because there has to be that level of trust um, that goes back and forth. Right. And um, and there are feelings for that, but I'd like to thank you for your time tonight. We appreciate talking to you. Well, thank you all for having me in. I appreciate it. Mr. Bergeron? Uh, I was going to ask a question that's off script, actually. <laughs> so we talked about um, unhappiness in the crew or unhappiness in the community and how they're reflective. Uh, have you ever had to uh, institute uh, culture change over time, and how has uh, that happened? How's it worked for you? What tools did you use? The police department culture? Any. Boy Scouts, baseball team, I don't care. Um, you know, certainly the job I'm in now. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I started, the police department and the fire department were not welcome in the schools. And when Tough we, schools. Tough schools, until the fire department said, if we can't have a key, we will find a way to get in. And then they, have, they, they always keys. have a master key in the truck. They, they always do. <laughs> At least one, That's if not right. two. That's right. But, you know, the thing that surprises me, not necessarily where I am now, but in general, that people are so disinclined to make a complaint. Hmm. And, really? you know, the, because there's this, there's this concern of, like, payback or retribution. And... If people have that kind of view of the police department, the police department's not doing it right. So, I mean, I have plenty of complaints that people will come to me, but it's a respectful disagreement or they have a legitimate complaint. And, it, and you know, I like to think anyway, I've certainly made my share of mistakes up there, but you learn from those and go forward. I would like to think that they at least, I may not agree with them, but at least we're gonna have a respectful discussion and when we go our separate ways, we still may disagree, but at least nobody's feelings are hurt, mm -hmm. and that doesn't change the fact that they feel they can they can pick up the phone and they can call the chief, they can call the sergeant, they can call an officer because there's this consti uh, consistency in the department. Because you know, being a police officer is not a job that you know the thing is everybody's happy to see a firefighter. But generally, when the police show up, that means something's bad. So people aren't happy to see a police officer all the time. So, you know, that's one of those things you have to work on every day. And in a small town, that's what I like about this, is that I have the opportunity to do that. And that police officers have the opportunity to do that. I have lost many officers in the time that I've been up in Shutesbury because of this kind of um, more well-rounded officer that I believe that we should have in a small town. Unfortunately, it serves them so well, they go to Wilbraham, they go to Greenfield, they go to other places. But that's a given, and I've always told the select board up there, look, it's a small town. You're going to get some really good people here. And that's partly my job, is to find those people to bring in front of the select board. However, there's only so much they can do in a small town. Now, you all are, are quite an exception in that the three full-time officers you have have been here a while. 
And that is pretty rare. So, you know, whether it's the community or you, the town, you all can take a bow, take credit for it, but that's pretty rare. And, and that is something that has value because, you know, that's that line of consistency. That if you're somebody who's lived in town 30 years, most of the officers you've known over half the time that you've lived here. And that's a big thing in, in, in Shootsbury is, especially on the part-time side, is those officers are looking to advance their career, and I would never hold them back. But it's always an issue with the community to say, who's the new person, you know? Or, or you know, what is that officer doing here? Sir, you're, you're paying that officer. That is the new part-time officer. So it's, it's a rare thing and a valuable thing to have the full-time people that you all have here. And, um, you know, I have worked it, over the years, I've, I've worked with all of them. They've come up to town, I've come down here. Of course, I live in town. Um, so, you know, th there's something that you have that is working right for those folks to, to still be here after the amount of time when they certainly could have gone other places, had more opportunities, more money, you know, all those things that people put a value on, they're still here. So you are doing something right. You just need somebody at the top who's gonna kind of maintain that. And I'm sure they have su suggestions for things that could be done better. And that's why I said, you know, the first thing to do is to sit down with the folks that you have and find out what they think is working and what they think is not working and go from there. It's interesting you talk about new people. One of the things that we've instituted for the last five, six, seven years is that all our new part-time officers and or full-time officers all come to our meeting to be introduced to the town. So, yeah. the, so they get it. So people get a chance to see them on camera, what they look like. To be on TV. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it's. Imp I, th I think it's important that, that you put a name to those to those faces for for our people in town. They they should know who their police officers, firemen. They should know who they are. Absolutely. Um, and you know, hopefully, they'd ever need to meet them in a time of crisis. But if they do, they you know, at least the face looks familiar. I mean, what we do is I have the full-time people and myself sit down with potential candidates. And then we do a kind of a, a screening based on the fit with the folks that we have. And then those people that we have a, an agreement on, then I make arrangements with the select board and they interview them. And, you know, generally that's worked out pretty well. Yeah, agree. David, any more? No, I think I'm good. Scotty, follow up? That's all. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Anything more for us? Did we change your mind? No. About another question or anything? <laughs> no, no. Okay. Were you trying to? No. Oh, okay. no. It was a soft one. <laughs> no. I, I actually think uh, I think these questions for, for all the candidates were easy questions, to tell you the truth. I, I I think we had three good we had three very good candidates. I think our yeah. search committee did a very nice job. Thank you. You guys did a very good job. Yeah, it's not a bad spot to be in for you all. It's not. <laughs> that will be, that's how we got Sherry, too. Yeah. Right, Sherry? Right. We, had th we had three excellent uh, town administrators after, after one of uh, our long-term Margaret had, had got, gotten a new job, and uh, we interviewed. Uh, we had a search committee. They brought back three. Um, we didn't think we could make a bad choice, and we sure didn't. <laughs> it, good. Very good.